Praise God, we're back. The Word of God. Uh, we've had a little worship. We've had some prayer. We've made supplications for the saints. We're going to talk about a a very important subject this Sunday. We're going to talk about something that at the end of it all just seems to be so utterly lacking in Christendom. And uh, in those that profess to know Jesus and uh, A power verse and a, a powerful verse that started me uh, toward thinking about this some 12 years ago. And uh, as I was dealing with my own attitudes and things that were needing worked out, and uh, Hebrews 4 and 1, let us for, therefore fear lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. We want to talk today about contentment. Contentment. I was, I, as it often is, I, I had been studying most of the week on a certain subject and uh, I had all my, all my things pieced together, all the ducks in a row and uh, God said this morning, well, how can you teach that until this How can I teach you how to do, how can you run with the horses if you can't run with the footmen? It is that serious. We look at the encouragement of God and it's not always a pat on the back and attaboy, keep trying. Oftentimes it's a question. See, uh, Cain could have took the exhortation of God and not killed his brother. When, he asked, when God asked him the question. And he could have got it together. He could have went and found out, what, figured out what was so good about Abel's offering that I couldn't have gave. And then he could have did like Abel and he would have been approved as well. But instead, he would not allow contentment. Discontentment. We have a, a nation of malcontents that are uh, burning and looting. And they call this grieving. Only, only in our modern day do people burn and loot buildings and someone says, well, it's okay, they're just grieving. Yeah. No, uh, it's not what you do when you're grieving. Right. It's a malcontent spirit. And ultimately, uh, we could blame Congress, we could blame uh, a lot of people but church, it's our fault. We haven't portrayed contentment. We have a, a church that's bent on miracles, that's all about uh, uh, manifestations and health and wealth and prosperity. Uh, without, and I believe in all those things are good and God wants us to have a, a, a life that is full of good things. I believe those things, but Paul uh, didn't put his, uh, he didn't put his gain in that. In other words, in 1 Timothy 6 and 6, he said, godliness with contentment is great gain. So he, he saw it better that he was in a prison house he said the root of the love of money is the root of all evil, but uh, godliness with some uh, count great gain as godliness. But he says godliness is great gain. You see, when you you got your faith in that money, that's the problem. A lot of these people that are malcontent, they say they want the the rich man to give them their some of their money, well, that's discontentment too. It's covetousness, just like the other is. One way or the other, the bottom line, uh, these uh, people over here and the people over here are both headed to the same 
funneled down into the same place called hell. Right. Uh, why? Because they're not counting godliness with contentment. There's something about contentment uh, that's so foreign to our life. Uh, uh, Elder Dallas uh, told me the story about how watching a cow that has this green grass behind him, a great looking pasture, he's driving by, and he sees this wonderful, beautiful scene of a great pasture. Looks like the brightest, greenest grass you can get on the whole county. And the cow, he's not content with that pasture, but he wants to stick his head through the fence and eat out of the side ditch. In the side ditch, there's cigarette butts, there's beer bottles, there's all kind of garbage. Uh, glass, broken uh, things, uh, uh, foul things that are people throw out of their litter that people throw out of their car. It's all in that in that ditch, and the the cow is somehow not content with that beautiful lush grass behind them. Wants to reach out and and get some of that grass over there. It might be better. That's a lack of contentment, saints, and a lot of us are just like those cows. Contentment. We're going to look at Philippians 4, if you will. You know, part of the first verse, and as my wife turns there, I'm going to let her read. And uh, But part of the verse says that, says, Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And I just want to hyper-focus on that. I want to turn our attention to those uh Seven words, uh, eight words it is, actually. Eight words there that mean so much. Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. That's the subtitle to the title today. Contentment being the title. Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Mm-hmm. You know, love is something you show. Paul showed his love over and over again. He didn't have to go around uh, telling everybody, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. They could see it. They saw it in his his life, how he treated them. And uh, even on both, that is the whole council, uh, the good, the bad, and the indifferent. Therefore, my brethren, go on and read that first verse for us, please. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. See, Paul, so often in, this is the fourth chapter of Philippians, but so often in the first uh, part of these letters, he would tell the how much that he loved them, but he would show, tell them that by telling them that I pray without ceasing for you. That's how he showed his love was for in his prayer life. And so, yeah, he would he would come out with that. A lot of us think that we can't say anything about ourselves, but Paul didn't think that way. He When he wrote a letter, he says, I pray without ceasing for you. I pray day and night prayers, he said, I think in Thessalonians. Uh, one of these letters says that. I'm not sure which one, but they all start with that same sentiment that, that Paul was someone that was praying continuously, and he saw the value in the saints. He saw them as dearly beloved. And that's the way uh, any of us that have a heart for God ought to see the saints. It's not a... a pleasure or a, a joy of any to shun someone or to... Uh, Do any of the things that we have to do as saints to hold the standard of God. It's still part of that dearly beloved. Uh, If someone is professing to be Christian and they're not doing that, I don't want to go on a rabbit trail, but not departing from iniquity, well then it's out of love 
It's because I dearly love those the saints that I have to reprove that person. And if they won't hear the rebuke, eventually you have to shun them. That's Bible. Right. It's all part of the love that we have for the saints. Hell is part of the love of God. So, but uh, that's another subject. My joy and crown. See how he he looked at them. He looked on the wealth of others, just like he said. He wasn't just a talker. He didn't just say these things, but he did them. He lived a life where he didn't consider his own burdens. He didn't consider his own troubles. He's not. He's in prison writing this letter right now. And uh, you don't see him pining about it. You don't see him trying to uh, do all kinds of things that people would do today to manipulate people into feeling bad for them and feeling sorry for them and doing all manner of things for them. Because why? Because he was content. He had contentment. In himself, he was content to be in shackles for Jesus Christ. Amen. Go on, verse uh, 2. I beseech ye, you, Yod <laughs> Yodius, uh -huh. and beseech Sancti, uh -huh. <laughs> that they may be of the same mind in the Lord. See, of the same mind. He's talking to these people. He's talking about unity and joy. He's beseeching these two people. Apparently they had a disagreement. Just be in the same mind in the Lord, you know. Uh, we might not see everything. I might like blue and you might like red, but we can still, if we're behind Jesus and we're united in Jesus, well then that's okay. I'm not worried about what you're personal preferences are and uh, as long as it's not sin it's fine we can stay in the same mind and the Lord he started looking to the wealth of others he said my dearly beloved I love you both uh, come together in the same mind in the Lord and I entreat thee verse 3 and I entreat thee also true yoke fellow true yoke fellow see Paul was very specific he's not talking to the false People that are yoked up with you, trying to act like Christian, but the true yoke fellow. Go on, verse three. Help those women which uh -huh. labored with me in the gospel. Okay, here's another division. Uh, women, uh, it says, don't have authority. That's true. I don't. I let my wife speak because she's a servant of God. Mm -hmm. She's not asking questions. Uh, dis disrupting the service of God. That's what that verse was talking about. Right. Have an understanding that women uh, were laboring in, with Paul in the gospel. Go on, with Clement. With Clement also, and with uh, other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. We need to get to a place where, uh, remember Luke uh, chapter 10, Luke chapter 10 talked about uh, that when he sent out his 70 disciples and they were so in awe and enamored with the idea that they could cast out demons and that they did many miracles and they were just wrapped up with the miracles. And in the 20th verse, he said, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. Don't rejoice in the miracles. Don't get, don't get in awe because uh, this happened or because that happened. So the dead got raised and the, the, the blind are seeing and the, and the deaf are hearing. But but don't get enamored with that. Don't get awestruck with that. But rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So, see, women in, in Paul's time weren't seeking titles either. That's the other thing. Not like the women today that all want to be pastors and apostles and everything. You, you see them and they got a title longer than, uh, longer than the the phone book and uh, you know and then you see when you see unholiness in them then you scratch your head and say how can that be of God who gave that woman a title yeah. see they weren't looking for a title anyone serving God shouldn't be looking for a title someone else should put that on you if you have contentment with the service of God this, I want to get to this, uh, 1828, I wrote this down for the thing, it's very important we get this 
listen to this uh, definition of contentment. Content, a resting satisfaction of mind without disquiet. And then it goes on to say acquiescence. And I'm, I'm not the smartest guy. I don't really know what acquiescence means, meant. So I looked it up. Acquiescence, a quiet assent, a silent submission, or submission with apparent content, distinguished from avowed consent on the one hand and on the other from opposition or open discontent, as an acquiescence in the decisions of a court or in the allotments of providence. So in other words, allowing God to have preeminence over your, your life and being content with whatever comes. If you, you do your best and things fall apart, well, God didn't intend for that to, to happen that way, and that's okay. You know, I'm content with what God has done. And I want to stay praising God for what He's done. Uh, the silent submission. That's what it talks about, these things for women. To be uh, quiet and having a, adorned with a meek spirit, you know. These women that were serving with Paul, he's adorning them uh, with godliness. He's saying, hey, uh, keep going, keep going. Uh, you're laboring with me in the gospel. They were out laboring in the gospel, whatever that looked like. And Paul was exhorting them. He was complimenting them. Same as Clement and his fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. See, when we realize, uh, is your name in the book of life, you ought to be able to acquiesce s to that you know to whatever comes whatever it takes for me to walk down this straight and narrow path as long so long as i am in fact on that straight and narrow path then i ought to be able to be content with that what comes and 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 just leave it very simple very simple uh as a child like faith coming to god with faith no, I, when I was a little child, I used to look up to my father, my earthly father. I thought he was a hero. I thought he could do anything. You know, I, I really thought in my mind, there's nothing that he can't do. You know, that wasn't necessarily true. But guess what? It is true of our heavenly father. Amen. It is true of him. And we can, just like a child, we can look up to God and, and, and believe him. And we can believe that we have a heritage in his promises. And we can be content with that. Whichever way it works out, Lord, it's okay. Not my will, but thy will be done. You talked in your testimony earlier today about Jesus having his beard plucked out. Being spit on by that company of, of soldiers. I think it was roughly like 500 soldiers. And if you could just imagine being spit on by 500 people... Uh, it's, it's unimaginable. It's unimaginable. But he made his face like a flint through the whole thing. And he didn't give them the satisfaction of knowing that they got to him. Why? Because he was submitted silently to God. Herod wondered, was in awe. Why won't you speak, you know? He looked for him to do a miracle. We talked about that. But he didn't even speak in Herod's court didn't even speak. That's the silent submission that we need, this acquiescence, this, this contentment. We're not uh, out in the streets rallying for our rights. But we're quietly surrendering to God and giving our life a living sacrifice. Read verse 4, if you would. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. There it is. Rejoice. I think this is three times that Paul mentions rejoicing in this chapter. Uh, but he said it twice in the same verse, and I just need to think on that a minute. Are we living a life where we're rejoicing? Always. 
Always. I was with a, another preacher in San Diego and something terrible, terrible, unmentionable happened to us as sometimes does happen in the open air. Uh, some uh, form of persecution that we endured and uh, I wanted to get mad in my spirit. I'd love to tell you that I was the Superman, but I was not that man. I was watching this person next to me though and they began to shout, Hallelujah! I'm persecuted for the name of Jesus! And I, it just, it, it became infectious. All of a sudden I'm not mad anymore. All of a sudden I'm rejoicing with my brother that we're being persecuted for the name of Jesus. Jesus, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. See, we can we can rejoice even though we're, uh, you know, we believe in the healing of God. But sometimes it doesn't happen. And, and while we're in that pain, we can still rejoice. And while we're in that, uh, in that uh, sickness, we can still rejoice. Now, this is not to shame someone for weeping because Paul also said weep with them that weep. So we're not trying to be so super spiritual spiritual that we don't take an honest assessment of what's going on but we ought to still at the end of it all come to a rejoicing where does that come from it comes from contentment are you satisfied with what a wonderful brother reminded me this last week and some things happened and and I uh, was wrestling with with anger and all of the emotions that, that come up when things happen, that do happen in this world. And he, he brought us back to a place, well, remember the promise of God. And I can remember when we were in the jail cell, how there was a moment there where I could just sense Jesus, like he was just sitting right next to. And uh, my wife was inside a, She'd asked to go in a private room and she was in there praying and she said she had the same thing going at the same time. Uh, she was praying in tongues and singing in tongues and, and rejoicing there in the jail cell. And she said the same testimony. It was around the same time. that. So we remembered that. And in remembering that, it just, it just took a load off the shoulders and, and the anger began to cease. And, and we have to remember the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. There is a righteous anger, but you can't get to that righteous anger until you've gotten rid of the earthly anger. The, the I'm standing for myself. That's, that's what we have to come against. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Go on, verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. I've heard Brother Reuben talk about uh, this a lot. Now the, the Dake says uh, mildness, patience, kindness, moderation, meekness, gentleness. All those words could be uh, interchanged there. But uh, it doesn't mean that it's moderately. Mm -hmm. That's not what it's talking about. He's saying uh, moderation. Think about uh, a moderator. He is able to talk, stand between two opposing forces and, and moderate an argument. Mm -hmm. Let your moderation be known. See, your, your contentment in the situation. You're not, you're not uh, tied to the, con to, uh, the outcome. Why? Because you know the ultimate outcome, that you're going to heaven. Whatever i got to go through to get there, so long as I'm on this straight and narrow path, then I know that I'm going to heaven. Are you willing to drink of this cup, Jesus said to John? James, they had brought their mother, the mother saying, oh, let my, my son sit one on your right and one on your left. He said, are you willing to drink of that, this cup? Oh, and they all said, oh, yes, oh, yes, we're willing, we're willing. And they all, whew, they all ran in the garden. But 
yet they did come back and they did drink of that cup. And, and Jesus said, you will drink of this cup. In, in other words, you better be ready. The only way we can do this is if we have contentment. Is God enough? Go on, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Let your requests be made known unto God. So oftentimes, we show our discontentment when we pray about a thing. And then what do you do next? You get on your phone, you call your neighbor, your friend, your girlfriend, or whatever. And you... Uh, Get on the phone and you rehearse everything that you just prayed about. And, and you might veil it as, oh, well, this is a prayer request, uh, whatever. But really, it's because you really weren't content with the prayer you just spoke. And now you're rehearsing it and regurgitating it, saying it over. When the Bible says that if you pray in secret, you'd get rewarded in the open. You're, 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 you're damaging your own, your own prayer when you bring it back up to someone else. You're telling God, I'm not really content that you'll do it. So I got to see if my friend here will do it. And your friend can't do it for you. Just not the same to say, hey, I request your prayer in this matter. That's good. But we need to be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving. Jesus said, if you believe, whatever you believe, you will receive. He said that. Did he say it or did he not? Yes. So be content with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Be like Paul. You know, Paul got more and more concerned with everyone else and less concerned with himself, less worried about himself. Matter of fact, I think you could say that Paul wasn't worried at all about himself. He wrote about being dead and, and your life is hid in Christ in Colossians. It's so important. Are you dead in Christ? Are you hid in Christ with God? Hid in God with Christ or whatever, it, however it says that. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> With Christ in God. Are you dead? See, dead men are very content. They don't stir. They don't move. Fight for their rights. They don't stand up for their rights. <laughs> Go on, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God. This is something he talks about twice in this chapter. And it's something that so many people, uh, they're looking for peace. And the Bible in Isaiah 26 says, uh, him who stays his mind on thee, O Lord, will be in perfect peace, for he trusteth in thee. 26 and 3. Do you trust in God? You know, uh, I was trusting in God that day when the jail cell, when I felt like Jesus was sitting right next to me and I, I was able to be content in that situation. But then another situation comes up and I, want, I have to wonder, I have to look back, was I still in that same contentment or have I fallen short once again? Lord, forgive me if it be that way. But we need contentment in our life. It, the lack of peace stems from the lack of contentment that we're we're still we still have a dog in the race we want a certain outcome that's what that's saying that's what this uh Webster's 1828 definition of acquiescence told me i mean it's got a lot of words in in the definition but the long and short of it is is you don't have a dog in the race it doesn't matter which way it goes as long as i end up in heaven I'm willing to go through it, whatever I have to go through. 
That's what it means to be really content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Not ungodliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Um, go on verse 8. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true... Whatsoever what things are true... Go on, what? Whatsoever things are honest... Honest... Whatsoever things are just... Just... Whatsoever things are pure... Pure... Whatsoever things are lovely... Lovely... Whatsoever things are of good report... Good report... If there be any virtue... Virtue... And if there be any praise... Praise... Hallelujah. Think on these things... So we have true... Honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praise. We're supposed to be thinking about these things. You know, Paul was very, very bold. He told people what to think. The Christians today would say, oh, no, well, we shouldn't tell people what to think. I heard yesterday, just yesterday, that we're supposed to just... Let people do whatever they want to do and, and uh, uh, not stand against any line of thought. Well, that's, yeah. that's absolute antichrist right, right there. Uh, the, uh, the people in Berea, I suppose it was, that burnt their books, uh, they, uh, they burnt those books because those books were wicked, not just because they were showing their repentance, but because they knew that these wicked uh, spell books that they had would cause other people to stumble. And so they burnt them. They don't want them to be on the face of the earth. That's the way I feel about a lot of knowledge that's out there. I wish we could throw it all in, a, right. in an ocean and be done with it and get rid of it so people wouldn't think that way anymore. That they'd start to think like God wants us to think. Think of things that are true and things that are honest and things that are just and things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are of a good report, and things with virtue. These bring virtue. Virtue is what we're missing in our life today, in our, in our society today. You look around, nobody has virtue anymore. Nobody really cares what anybody thinks, and they'll tell it to you all day long. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't, well, I don't care about them if I'm living godly and they think that's wrong. That's true. That's true. But I need to, I need to have some virtue virtue in me. I want to live for God. I want to have righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. These things are virtue. You know, at first, uh, Second Peter, the first chapter, tells you about building virtue. It tells you that if you do these things, you shall not fail. Why don't we get it? We're failing because we haven't got the first thing right. The very first block is to make sure that you're in the rest of God. That's the first thing. Not uh, standing up for abortion. I'm going to tell you straight. Some of you got abortion ministries and you're adopting children and you're going to make them twice the uh, children of hell that you are. That's what's going to happen. You need to repent. You got an idol. That's what's going to happen. And you think you're out there doing a good work. And you don't have the first thing right. You'll make twice the child of hell as you. With those children you're adopting. It's terrible. Because we've gotten to such a place. In the body of Christ, suppose it. Now, the true body of Christ, I, I, they're rejoicing right now. Amen. The true body of Christ, with what I'm saying, doesn't hear hard sayings. They hear the truth. Their spirit is soaring because it's the truth. Oh, I want to hear the truth, Lord. I was in a goat church that was filled with wicked people that were drinking, fornicating, doing all manner of evil. And they'd come on Sunday and... Oh, glory to God. There's no glory to God in that place. I knew it. My spirit knew it. Someone came and patted me on the back when I was confessing sin. I looked at him and I went to the other end of the pew. I was expecting lightning to come down from the, from the sky. Because she wasn't talking about anything that was true. She wasn't, ta she wasn't being honest. 
telling me that it's okay. God knows. God knows, and he's going to... He's got a place for fornicators. Right. That was the truth. If she had said that, I would have said, thank you, Jesus, for reproving me because my spirit was, was groaning for some truth, groaning to hear the truth. Someone that just be honest. Tell me about what's just. Just. Pure. Lovely. These things bring good report. Virtue and praise. Go on, verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. The God of peace shall be with you. The word of God is true. If you'll do these things, you'll have the God of peace with you. Uh, he never leaves us or forsakes us, but the truth is, a lot of times, we're now walking toward Him. We've shut it off. We've started to uh, get out of submission. We're not under the authority of God anymore, and we're not under that umbrella anymore, and that's why we're not having the peace of God anymore. Because on some level, we weren't content with what God said was okay. God put Job through trials. He was, uh, he was scraping his body with a pot shard just for some relief. And uh, his friends, so-called, were beating him up, saying he must be in sin because of these things happening. And yet, Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He was content with God. And he was fighting to keep that contentment. His friends, so-called, were trying to take that contentment away from him, trying to uh, diminish that contentment, trying to destroy that contentment. That's the battle that we need to be faced with, that we're facing every moment, every day. How long can you sit quiet? Are you content with God? Are you resting in the crucified? Go on, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. In the Lord greatly I rejoiced. Go on. But now, at the last, your care of me has flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Uh-huh. They were careful for Paul. They... They sent a gift to Paul. And uh, they wanted to send a gift before and they didn't have the opportunity. See, this church at Philippi was the only church that had a giving spirit. Now, I don't believe in a legalistic tie that uh, I have to do it uh, this way or that way. But I believe that a person that really has the spirit of God will find the spirit of giving will find a heart, have a heart that wants to give because it's good to give. It's better to give than to receive. They had this spirit. They were the, they were the first of the churches to show that giving spirit. He didn't browbeat them into that either. Go on, verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Therewith to be content. And whatever happens, Paul learned to be content. What about you, say? I ask myself the same question. Am I content with this, what life has granted me? I'm blessed. But do I always remember that? Do I continually stay in that contentment? Read verse 12, if you would. Sorry. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So Paul didn't look at it when he was, he says, uh, uh, I die daily. He wasn't necessarily talking about I die in my uh, die to sin. That's not what he's saying. He's saying I die daily. It looks like death everywhere around me. I go into it. I'm thinking about I might get fed to the lions today. He was stoned and left to dead. And somebody dragged him back into town and brought him back to life. 
uh, uh, he was blinded, he'd been gone through everything in order to come to God. And he realized that all those things were what brought him to God. They weren't to break him, they were to make him. He understood to lose his life, there he would gain it. If you just lose your life today for Christ, you'd gain your life. You'd come to Him in all truth, in all your spirit, all your soul, all your mind. You'd love God. Then you'd love your neighbor as yourself. Then you'd begin to do the work of the kingdom. Paul understood how to be rich. And he understood how to be poor, how to be healthy, and how to be suffering. And then he went on to say, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's not a, a permission of the things you can do in your life. That's not, uh, this is the verse is not talking about liberty. It's talking about that you can, you can either have plenty or you can have not enough and you can still get through it because of Christ, because He's going to strengthen you through it. If you're hungry, He said in hungerings and fastings, that tells me sometimes He set out to fast. He had food, He probably gave it to somebody poor. And He said, I'm fasting today, so I'm just going to give my food to Charlie over here on the step. You know, whatever. And sometimes he didn't even have food, so he had to go hungry. But he still was content, and Christ strengthened him through that situation. People try to use this verse in so many kind of ways. And just simple logic would tell you that's true, not true. You know, if I say I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, I don't believe you're going to allow me to start to operate on your brain because I'm quoting a verse. <laughs> now, you're going to want to see some credentials first. I can do all things. It's not talking about liberty. It's not talking, it's not some you can do it kind of speech. It's telling you if you just get content, no matter what comes at you in life, you can be content there and Christ will strengthen you. The anointing of God will come and, 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 anoint, and, and, and strengthen you. Go on, verse 14. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Uh-huh. See, they, they met his need. They met his need, Philippi. They were the first of the churches. See, he couldn't just ask people. Paul knew how to live a life. Like uh, in Walk About Jesus in this ministry that God has put me into, uh, I don't do fundraisers. I don't uh, go around you don't constantly see me uh, crying for money. I don't put up pictures that look like I'm praying with someone just so you'll get uh, something manipulated into giving me money. But it's amazing how many times when I've been in needs where someone that I would have never thought about just shows up and puts that need forth. They didn't know about it. I didn't ask them about it. But God gave them that word to do that, and they were obedient. See, when we do all these other things, we run the church like it's a business, and we're always pleading for money, always begging in the street. It's terrible. It's a terrible witness. And it, it feeds church people that are greedy inwardly. See, the cheerful heart will weed out greediness. It will weed out covetousness. It can't stay in a person that's cheerful, a person that's grateful, a person that uh, has the right heart. It comes from contentment. He knew that if he were to ask Corinth for money, they were already divided. So they were saying, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of, of Cephas. They were already divided about little things. If they, He started asking them for money there. That's why in the whole time he was in Corinth, uh, something like a year, year and a half, he was working day and night in front of them. So they'd see that he wasn't trying to uh, hustle them out of their money. It wasn't that. Because they were 
very carnal. But this church in Philippi, they had the heart to give, and they did give on two occasions at least that we know of. Uh, go on, verse 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Go on, verse 16. Just For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. So we need to be careful when we read this scripture. It's not saying that no church ever gave to him, but he's saying when I departed from Macedonia. Uh, you know, he's, he's given a time frame, but the bottom line is... This church at Philippi, I believe, is the first church that, that really broke through into that giving spirit that he was preaching to all of them. He was telling them all that they should do that. You see parts of it in every letter where he'd say, uh, look not to yourself, but look to the wealth of another. Or, uh, be uh, more mindful of others than them set yourself. That's, that's the heart of God. See, God wants us to have that benevolent love for each other, that we want the best for everybody involved. Am I hard on sin? Yes, because I know what it does to people. I know what it did to me before I was saved. And I know what it's done to my life even as I followed Jesus. It's never done any good. It's shameful. We don't have to live in that life. We can be content with Christ. And whatever comes, in whatever state. But he says uh, in verse 18, but I have all. He said, uh, backing up verse 19, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may be bound to your account. See, he wants to brag on them. He wants to be certain because he sees this cheerful giving in them. He sees them giving, and so he knows that they have, that's part of the heart of God. And he said, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that it may abound to your account. See, that little gift, someone gave you $100, once that $100 is long gone, but I still remember that person, and I still rejoice for that person, because I know in that moment they were hearing from God, because it was the exact amount that I needed. And only God could have done that, and uh, brought that person with cheer to give up such a large amount of money that... Uh, would be uh, could be uh, the a breaking point on someone, you know. Uh, that widow might that she gave all she had. That's the spirit that God wants us to give to. And then uh, you, we see the rich young ruler go and give all to the poor. We don't say hear him say stay poor. He just said this is what you have. Go and give it away. It's likely that God would have put it all right back to him because he was a. It's a terrible master. Money is a terrible master. But if you learn contentment, godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, but I have, have all in abound and fool, having received of Ephroditus the things which were sent from you. And listen what he's really so happy about. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. See, he blessed that, that offering. Jesus said, if you give us a prophet, a glass of water with faith, like a child, he talked about. If you give a, you, you get the prophet's reward. See, it's better to give than receive. But you can't do that until you're content I went through a time where uh, there was a problem with my taxi and uh, it was about a $200 fix and I just wasn't having any business at that time. I was just praying over every nickel and uh, it came to my attention that someone in the church needed a certain amount of money for uh, this medicine that they needed. And God said, get, you want that money? Give that money away. Well, at that time, I didn't necessarily have that kind of contentment. I had to, I had to dig down in myself and say, Lord, why don't I have, why can't I just get in my pocket and just give it? 
And I, I found it there. I found that grateful heart right there, that contentment happened right there on the altar and I gave that money away. And it wasn't uh, less than a day that God really did bless me with, with what I needed. And it was amazing. It didn't, didn't happen because I worked 10 hours and I got $110 an hour and uh, whatever. It didn't happen that way didn't happen because of my work of my hands. It happened because God poured out that blessing. Because I had really in that moment, at least in that moment, I had found that contentment. So it's what we have to see is that we need to hold on to it because you can lose it. You can, you can let go of contentment. You can forget about contentment. It's very easy to do. Go on, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. See, I, uh, my wife brought something up the other day on this verse, talking on 19, uh, 4 and 19 Philippians. Uh, my God shall supply all your needs. And my wife brought up this point that so many people that are saints, that are talked about, that are uh you know, that their, their life stories are magnified before men, uh, they ended up with very little possessions. They ended up, uh, you know, Wesley has said he had two changes of clothes or something like this, but he'd, he'd run millions of dollars through orphanages and helped so many children uh, to eat and to be clothed and to have a place to live and grow up. And uh, he'd done so many things with the money that he had. That's, the, that's what, where his heart was. His treasure was in those children. His treasure was in the people that were coming to him in numbers, listening to his preaching out in the, out in the field. See, so, but, but the thing that, that, that Wesley had was that he was content with godliness. He did, you don't see where he's writing about, I wish I had a, a nicer horse. You don't see him writing, uh, well, uh, I'd get a lot more done if I had a, a streamlined buggy uh, that I could, a buckboard, you know. He don't, you don't see that there. He was content with the things he had. And he realized the word, key word is need, not your desire. Uh, it doesn't mean God's going to give you a Cadillac. It doesn't mean God's going to give you a mansion. Where's your heart, saying? Are you content with godliness? If you would be, well, then you'd live this verse out. And God would be supplying all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let's just end this out and read these last verses here. It's such a, a good benediction. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Are you, are you settled? Do you believe that God is God? Do you believe he's holy? You know, that means the pantheists, they believe everything is God. And in that, there is no specific thing that's God. Everything is God. Uh, I'm God. You're God. Uh, the, the, the birds out there are God. Uh, all the grass is God. Everything's God. So there's nothing specific that's God. That's not the Christian God. The Christian God is holy. That means he's set apart from everything that he made. He made it all and he's apart from it all. He, that's why he's the perfect lawgiver and the judge. Because he's not part of it. He doesn't have a dog in the race. He doesn't, he's not tied to a specific outcome. As a matter of fact, the only outcome is the one that he said will come to pass. That's the one that will come to pass. Uh, this earth will melt with fervent heat. This heaven will melt with fervent heat. And we'll have a new heaven and a new earth because he said it in his word. The word of God will endure forever. If you believe that, then you can say this with me. Now unto God and our Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, even when you're persecuted, Richard Wormbrandt went through a horrible persecution. Uh, he, he, he said that he uh, was prepared by the Nazis to go through what the Russians would give him. 
the communists would give him. He said that was just preparation when he was being tortured by the Nazis. He said that was just kindergarten. And now I'm in high school. He was, he was beat, whipped, spit on, everything. If you think that nobody has went through like Jesus, I'm sure he started to scratch his head and think, well, I've seen lots of people crucified right here in the gulag. But it was more than that. Jesus went through all that with the weight of every single person's sin on his shoulders. He was separated from his father. And he cried out, my God, my God, how, why have thou forsaken me? Something that had never happened for Jesus. Richard Wormbrandt never went through that. He didn't die for our sins. And he still can rejoice knowing all the things that he went through in life. He doesn't blame God. See, there's people out there right now you're blaming God because you're not content with the things you have because you think you deserve so much better. And the truth is, friend, you don't deserve anything but hell. That's the real truth. You deserve hell. And God sent his only son to die on the cross. You didn't have to go to hell. That's the truth. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. It was His glory to send His Son. Jesus said, I don't come to fulfill my own thing. I'm not here to do my thing, but that what I see the Father in heaven, that I do also. He, he, taught, he says, I'm, I can of my own self do nothing. He didn't come for Himself. He said, if there be any other way, Lord, take this cup from me. But nonetheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It was glory to the Father to put his son on the cross. To give you an opportunity to be redeemed into the holy family. That you can be holy as God is holy. We can be separated from this world. But first we have to be content with the Father. Verse 21, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. See, there were brethren there with Paul that were glad to hear about this church at Philippi. Uh, Paul had bragged on them. All the saints salute you. Chiefly those that are, they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with you all. Amen. So we need to go into our prayer closet. Even today, saying, go into your prayer closet. Are you content with God? Are you content with your life? Come what may. Some of you are going through things you didn't even see coming. We, we have a brother that I, in the hospital right now, and I promise you, two days ago, if you'd asked him if he thought he'd be in the hospital, he'd said no. But I see that he wants to glorify God, and that, that picks my spirit up. Because he's content. Godliness with contentment. Is great gain. Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Be content. Learn to be content with what you have. If you can do that, you'll have something that the people that are fighting in the street don't have. It's what they're looking for. I can't say that they'll take it from you, but at least you have it to offer. If you're, if you're truly content, then you have something that probably 99 out of 100 or more don't have. Just be content with what God has done. Let the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Be 
view of all that's been spoken, Lord. And though we know we're admonished to come boldly before your throne, Lord, we, we, we don't know how to come, Lord, without acknowledging, Lord, that you are mighty in all your ways. And that your blood that was shed on Calvary's cross was sufficient to wash us of our sins, Lord. Help us bring all the pain all the suffering that we go through and this flesh most of all this flesh this flesh that just doesn't want anything godly that just doesn't want anything that's righteous help us as Paul said to hold it in subjection lest we that preach the gospel would ourselves be cast away Help us, Lord. Help us, Jesus. Help us just to be content, Lord God. With such as what you've given, Lord. Praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You, Lord, I haven't had a chance to re read the prayer request, but Lord, I just, I just touch and agree with every godly prayer of them that are out there. And I just call each of us to submit our will to you. And we can be holy, separated for your purpose. Let the washing of the word take place in our heart today, Lord. Let this contentment well up in us and give us strength today. We just praise you today. Thank you, Lord. Give you the glory. Jesus' name, amen. amen. Saints, if you have any questions or comments, uh, uh, if you uh, ha disagree with anything I've said, please put it in the comments or feel free to write a uh, uh, message, whatever. But most of all, I just want you to think on contentment today. If you're uh, content with God and everything that He is and everything that He does, that's my hope for you. And, and so we thank you for joining in. Amen.